What are disinfectants? How do they work? And which disinfectants are most commonly used? A disinfectant is a chemical which is able to inactivate or destroy microbes. If you've ever given a blood sample before, the attending nurse probably disinfected your arm with chlorhexidine, but when are certain disinfectants used? I've spent a fair amount of time on Zoom calls, and for some reason, people use microphones which are such poor quality that I have to disinfect my eardrums. Let me introduce you to the ModMic Wireless. It's a wireless microphone that lets you easily connect to your existing headphones. I've owned several headsets in the past, and I'm always underwhelmed with how poor the audio quality is. Fortunately, you can connect the ModMic Wireless to any headset you like using the included adhesive magnet. The microphone can be recharged when you use it, or you can charge it when it's not in use. If you want to quickly mute the microphone, all you have to do is click the button on the side. The ModMic Wireless uses a USB-A type receiver, and it's compatible with Windows, Mac, Linux, as well as PlayStation devices. This is what the regular microphone sounds like on the Valve Index. Maybe you like playing VR chat, and maybe you just want to flex on your friends. You're thinking of upgrading to something a little bit better than what you're used to. You can hear the improvement between the ModMic Wireless from Antline Audio and the stock microphone that the Valve Index has. If you're worried about taking it on and off, it has this nice little convenient magnet, which you can just disconnect just like that. Oh no, it fell off. Simple as to put right back on. While your friends might all have VR headsets, they probably don't have a microphone as good as the ModMic Wireless. It's pretty convenient. See for yourself. It has this nice little connector on it so that it's able to line up and magnetically snap into place. Upgrade your audio game and buy the Mod Mic Wireless today using the link in my description. That way, Antline Audio will know you came from here. I want to thank Antline Audio for their support of this channel. The first molecule for this tier list is phenol. Phenol was initially used as a germicide, but it's seen some use as a disinfectant in the past 30 years due to its antimicrobial properties. Most phenol-based disinfectants are derivatives of phenol, such as orthophenylphenol or orthobenzylparachlorophenol. Phenol induces progressive leakage of intracellular contents in bacteria, including the release of potassium cations. This can lyse rapidly growing cultures of bacteria, even at low concentrations. Phenol and other phenolic disinfectants possess antifungal and antiviral properties, being able to damage the cell membranes causing leakage of intracellular contents. I decided it would be fun to synthesize some phenol from salicylic acid. Overall, while phenol can be used as a disinfectant, it's much too toxic to be used on people anymore. Unless you're trying to get part of the nail bed of your nail removed, which isn't so much as a disinfectant, but rather to just like kill your own cells by like disinfecting you against yourself, it's just too effective. Nice. For that reason, I think we're going to have to put phenol into like C tier. Yes, it's able to work, so are some phenol derivatives, but it's just not too user friendly. I will say that phenol is sometimes used still as a throat wash, but there's better alternatives that exist. If you've ever deep throated some phenol, make sure you leave a comment down below. Because it's throat wash, right? That's all we're talking about. We're talking about having a clean throat. <laughs> is your throat clean? The next chemical for this tier list is isopropanol. Isopropanol is a colorless flammable organic compound. It's the simplest example of a secondary alcohol, and it's rapidly able to kill bacteria. Because it's bactericidal, that means that it kills the bacteria rather than just inhibiting it from growing. Some disinfectants are able to work by inhibiting stuff from growing, but isopropanol just wipes them out. This is often used as a really common disinfectant. If you've ever been to your pharmacy, you've probably seen a bottle of isopropanol there before, but it's not used for sterilizing medical or surgical equipment, since isopropanol isn't sporicidal and it can't penetrate protein-rich materials. Its mechanism of action involves the denaturation of proteins. It's been shown that alcohols destroy the dehydrogenase enzymes of E. coli. It's more bactericidal than ethanol for E. coli, as well as for Staphylococcus aureus. So for that reason, isopropanol is a little bit better. It can't sterilize equipment though, so I think we're going to have to put it in B tier, because it could be better. The most effective concentration of isopropanol is actually 70%. So if you're going any higher than 70%, you're just wasting your isopropanol. If you have 99% isopropanol, it'll evaporate faster, and if your goal is to disinfect a surface, then you want to have it lasting there as long as possible. So for that reason, 70% isopropyl alcohol is preferred. Here we have bleach. This is everybody's favorite disinfectant. Bleach is sodium hypochlorite. There are other forms of bleaches that exist, but sodium hypochlorite is most commonly referred to as bleach. 
This has been a household disinfectant or bleaching agent since the 18th century. It's the oldest and most important chlorine-based bleach. Mixing bleach with other cleaning products can produce chlorine gas, which was used as a chemical weapon in World War I. Bleach will react with almost everything, so it's probably not a good idea to mix it with any other cleaning products unless specifically instructed to do so. I have never seen any instructions to mix bleach with stuff, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say you should not be mixing it with stuff, unless it's water. If you mix bleach with ammonia, it will not make mustard gas, but it will make nitrogen trichloride, which is explosive and extremely corrosive and offensive. So please do not mix bleach and ammonia. Additionally, when excess ammonia and sodium hydroxide as well as bleach are mixed, this can generate hydrazine. This is rocket fuel and it's also extremely toxic. While it does a really good job as a disinfectant with strong biocidal action, it's highly corrosive, but it has limited environmental impact. So sodium hypochlorite bleach, it's a pretty good antiseptic. I think we're probably going to have to put it into A tier, but maybe it belongs in S tier. We can put it into S tier if we're underwhelmed by any of the other ones. Next we have formaldehyde. This is a monoaldehyde. This is the simplest aldehyde that exists in chemistry, and it's freely soluble in water. In its pure form, it exists as a gas. This is used as a disinfectant both when it's a liquid, but also when it's a gas. However, it works more slowly than glutaraldehyde, which is the next one on this list. Formaldehyde can also be used in combination with low temperature steam, so that it sterilizes more effectively. It's extremely reactive, and it interacts with protein, DNA, and RNA in vitro. Formaldehyde is able to kill bacteria by forming protein-protein cross-linkages, and it's also able to kill viruses by cross-linking proteins with DNA. This is because formaldehyde is able to alkylate things twice, since the addition of two nucleophiles to formaldehyde will eliminate water. This is actually how we're able to form phenylformaldehyde resin, which is a polymer derived of formaldehyde, through the condensation of formaldehyde with phenol. At low concentrations, formaldehyde has been shown to be sporicidal by inhibiting germination on Bacillus subtilis spores. This is a pretty nasty chemical. It's even able to preserve specimens long term, which is probably also because it kills everything that could potentially grow in there. So I think formaldehyde's probably going to have to go into S tier. Next, we have glutaraldehyde, which arguably is better than formaldehyde. This is a dialdehyde that's used as a disinfectant and a sterilant for low temperature disinfections and sterilization of endoscopes. Endoscopes are scopes that go inside of you, hence the endo. Prepare your endo for the scope. You won't be remembering anything, me Paco. Like formaldehyde, its mechanism of action involves the cross-linking of proteins in the cell membrane. Its antimicrobial activity is due to the alkylation of hydroxyl, carbonyl, and amino groups, which impacts RNA, DNA, as well as protein synthesis. Glutaraldehyde has been shown to be pH sensitive as it's more active at alkaline than acidic pHs due to there being more reactive sites at the cell surface. Glutaraldehyde has been shown to have a broad spectrum of activity against bacteria, fungi, as well as viruses. So I think glutaraldehyde's probably actually better than formaldehyde, so why don't we move formaldehyde down into A tier? A for aldehyde. And we're going to have to put glutaraldehyde into S tier. It's clearly a little bit better than formaldehyde. Next we have chlorhexidine. This is used as a common disinfectant in sterilizing surgical equipment. It's also used at my sister's job, where she works as a vet tech. They use it for many different purposes, and they even have to wash their hands with it. Chlorhexidine is also used in cosmetics. It's used in toothpaste, mouthwashes, and also in some deodorants. Additionally, it's a preservative in some eye drops. The target of chlorhexidine is the inner cytoplasmic membrane of bacteria, and it's most preferred over other disinfectants due to its broad spectrum efficacy and its low irritation on the skin. Its mechanism involves dissociating release of a chlorhexidine cation, which binds to the negatively charged cell walls of bacteria. At low concentrations, this can cause the bacteria to stop reproducing, but at high concentrations, the cytoplasm will congeal and cause cell death. It's apoptosis time, baby! It's ototoxic, which means that if it's put in the ears, it can cause deafness. It's also possible that chlorhexidine may be a potential carcinogen, but it's currently unknown. Chlorhexidine, this is the most common disinfectant that I've seen used when giving blood, when you have to give a blood sample, when you get some surgery. So for that reason, I think chlorhexidine also has a place right into S tier. Povidone iodine. This can be used to sterilize cow teats, which is oftentimes why you can find it at a farm. Povidone is known as polyvinyl pyrrolidinone. Povidone is just a polymer of N-vinyl pyrrolidinone, and this polymer is water-soluble, and it forms a complex with the iodine. So this water-soluble polymer is a binder for medications, as well as hydrogen iodide and elemental iodine. This contains a total iodine species, or 1% of the total content, as iodine. 
It works by releasing iodine, resulting in the death of a range of microorganisms such as Staphylococcus aureus. It's most often used in healthcare as a disinfectant before and after surgery for healing minor cuts. This and other iodophore disinfectants, unlike iodine itself, are non-staining and relatively free of irritancy and toxicity. So this is another pretty decent disinfectant, so for that reason, I think we're going to have to put it into S tier. S for cow teats. Here we have hydrogen peroxide. During the pandemic, I had to go to the dentist, and they made me do a mouthwash with hydrogen peroxide, and the taste of hydrogen peroxide is not good. It is way worse than water. It is the taste of cursed water. Hydrogen peroxide is a reactive oxygen species, and it's the simplest peroxide. This is widely used as a disinfectant, and it's commercially available in concentrations varying from 3 to 90%. It also has broad-spectrum efficacy against bacteria as well as viruses. However, it has a greater effect against gram-positive bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria just have a thick cell wall made of something called peptidoglycan, but this isn't as effective against gram-negative bacteria. The presence of enzymes such as catalase and peroxidase in these organisms can help strengthen their tolerance to hydrogen peroxide, as they're able to break it down. This acts as an oxidant by releasing free hydroxyl radicals, which are highly reactive and attacks essential components of the cell, such as the DNA through strand breakage. Hydrogen peroxide is a pretty broad-spectrum antiseptic, so for that reason, I think we can put it right into S tier. Next we have chlorxylenol. This was one that I hadn't come across before. This is often used in hospitals as a disinfectant, and it's commonly found in antibacterial soaps. Similar to hydrogen peroxide, it's extremely effective against gram-positive bacteria. It has a similar mechanism of action to chlorhexidine by disrupting the cell wall while also inactivating bacterial enzymes. It's also been shown to be effective against SARS-CoV-2. To humans, it's moderately toxic, and it's a mild skin irritant, so this may cause allergic reactions to some. Because it may cause some allergic reactions, I think we're going to have to put it into A tier. A for allergies. Next, we have potassium permanganate. This is a very strong oxidizing agent, which we see used a lot of the time in organic chemistry. This is industrially used as a strong oxidizing agent, and it's used in the synthesis of organic compounds such as ascorbic acid and chloramphenicol. Before chlorine was used, potassium permanganate was used as a disinfectant in water treatment by removing hydrogen sulfide and iron from the water via a manganese green sand filter. Since it's difficult to dose this correctly, it's strongly advised not to use potassium permanganate as a disinfectant, and it's been replaced in the water treatment industry by chlorine as well as sodium hypochlorite. So potassium permanganate, it just oxidizes the crap out of everything, so it's going to be pretty effective as a disinfectant, but it isn't too great because it's a little bit too harsh. So for that reason, we're going to put it into A tier. This is benzalkonium chloride. This one probably surprises you a little bit because it doesn't look too much like the other ones we've discussed so far. This is a quaternary ammonium center, and there's different lengths of this long alkyl chain depending on the mixture that's used. This works as a cationic surfactant. It's the active ingredient in many disinfectant products such as hand sanitizers, algicides, eye drops, as well as lysol due to its antimicrobial activity. Its antimicrobial activity is dependent on the chain length. For instance, yeast and fungi are most affected by C12, this is a C8 chain. Meanwhile, gram-positive is impacted by C14 and gram-negative is impacted by C16. So it's actually good to have a mixture of these so that it's biocidal to all the different types of pathogens that may be present. The most biocidal members of this class are the C12 and C14 derivatives, and its mechanism involves disrupting the membrane bilayer by the alkyl chains and disrupts the charge distribution from the charged nitrogen. So this is basically a soap that just wipes out fungi as well as bacteria. So this is pretty impressive. I'm not sure if this is antiviral, but it does show good use against bacteria as well as fungi. So for that reason, I think we're going to put it into A tier, which is appropriate because it's an ammonium. Here we have lactic acid. If you like 3D printing, you'll be very familiar with PLA, which is polylactic acid. Lactic acid is a type of carboxylic acid that's naturally produced from pyruvate via the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase during anaerobic respiration. Lactic acid acts as a disinfectant by crossing the cell membrane of bacteria and making the inside of the cell acidic. It can also denature proteins and destroy viral envelopes. Lactic acid was used a lot during COVID after we ran out of rubbing alcohol almost everywhere. Lactic acid has a place in cuisine. If you're a fan of lactose, then you're probably a fan of lactic acid, as many ferments produce lactic acid as well. Lactic acid has also been used in antimicrobial soaps as a replacement to triclosan due to its health concerns. So lactic acid is pretty good. It's antiviral and it's also antibacterial. So for that reason, I think we're going to have to put it right into S tier. S for this stinks. I hate the smell of lactic acid. This is propylene glycol. 
This is a viscous colorless liquid that's used to produce polymers, and it's one of the main liquids in e-cigarettes, along with glycerin. Propylene glycol is also used as an air disinfectant. At low concentrations, propylene glycol is able to rapidly reduce the number of airborne bacteria. Oftentimes, if you have like cooking ingredients, such as like almond flavor or orange flavor, these are suspended in propylene glycol, as this can be food grade and safe to consume. As an air disinfectant, this is odorless, non-irritating, and non-toxic when given orally and intravenously. So because this isn't directly killing the bacteria, it's just kind of like sucking the particles out of the air into the propylene glycol. I think this one's a bit lamer, and I think we're going to have to put this into like D tier, but maybe it even belongs in F tier. What doesn't belong in F tier though is the next chemical, ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is a cyclic ether and it's the simplest epoxide that can exist in organic chemistry. However, this is a colorless and extremely flammable gas. It's also extremely toxic. It's used as a surface disinfectant for sterilizing medical equipment in order to replace steam in sterilization of heat sensitive tools. If you've ever worked with syringes and needles before and you're wondering if they're sterile or not, they're usually sterilized by treatment with ethylene oxide. Like formaldehyde, ethylene oxide is a broad-spectrum alkylating agent that mainly targets proteins, nucleic acids, and other organic compounds. Ethylene oxide is both mutagenic and explosive, but not harsh on sensitive equipment. Since this is a carcinogen, it's something you definitely want to avoid. It probably doesn't surprise you that ethylene oxide is an IARC group 1 carcinogen, meaning that there's evidence that it causes cancer in humans. So ethylene oxide is extremely effective, but it's very toxic to people. So for that reason, I think we're going to have to put it into A tier. This is ozone. Ozone is an extremely cursed looking molecule because it's effectively oxygen gas that got into a car accident. Ozone is a type of gas composed of three oxygen atoms that's less stable than diatomic oxygen. It acts as a powerful oxidant and is used in ozonolysis reactions to cleave alkenes and alkynes in order to make aldehydes, ketones, in addition to carboxylic acids. Ozone is used as a disinfectant for water treatment. Compared to chlorine, ozone needs a lower concentration and a shorter contact time to exert its disinfectant effects. Ozone is highly effective in killing bacteria and inactivating viruses on surfaces and suspended in air due to its nature as a strong oxidizing agent. Ozone aerosolization looks to be an effective alternative antimicrobial delivery system. Ozone can also be used to remove the smell of smoke from a smoker's car, as it's able to just oxidize the crap out of all of the cigarette smoke in their car. However, if you're ever going to do this, make sure you do this carefully and that you're not in the car when this is being done. Otherwise, you're going to have the same fate as the smoke. So ozone's extremely potent, but it's really toxic to people. So for that reason, I think we're going to have to put it into A tier, even though it's an extremely effective disinfectant. Speaking of extremely effective, why don't we talk about sodium dichloroisocyanurate? This is a chlorine-releasing chemical, which is used as a disinfectant, biocide, and industrial deodorant, primarily in water purification. This is a more water-soluble version of TCCA, also known as trichloroisocyanuric acid. Sodium dichloroisocyanurate is soluble in water, and it can form hypochlorous acid when undergoing hydrolysis, causing death to bacteria. It's well known that bacteria are resistant to common antimicrobial agents, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but these are still inhibited by sodium dichloroisocyanurate. Since they're only inhibited by this, while this can still kill bacteria through the active chlorine it releases, this one's less effective overall, so for that reason, I think we're going to have to put it into B tier. So, we have a few left here. Why don't we talk about chlorine? Chlorine is really commonly used, and it's highly effective as a disinfectant used to kill bacteria in water by forming hydrochloric acid and hypochlorous acid, most commonly in swimming pools, as well as water supplies. Chlorine acts as a strong oxidizing agent. It can disintegrate membrane lipids and inactivate enzymes and other proteins. One drawback is that it may react with other organic compounds present to form disinfection byproducts such as trichloromethane or chloroacetic acids, which are carcinogenic. It might surprise you to know that in chlorine sterilized drinking water, there's usually detectable amounts of chloroform present through the chlorination process that I just mentioned. So chlorine overall, it's really effective. If your water ever has a smell, it's probably from the chlorine or from the chlorinated byproducts in it. So it's pretty effective overall. I think we're going to have to put it into S tier since most tap water is sterilized by chlorine at this point, even though it's not too effective to people. This is bromine. Bromine is kind of similar to chlorine, and it's primarily used for water disinfection by forming hypobromous acid, which is a little bit less effective than chlorine is for killing bacteria. Bromine shouldn't be used for disinfecting drinking water, as free bromine is highly toxic and it reacts with other organic substances. 
When hypobromite is present in water in the presence of UV light, bromates can form, and bromate salts are known to be carcinogens. So this is an additional reason why bromine shouldn't be used for drinking water. This is oftentimes used for like hot tubs, oftentimes for whatever reason bromine is used in hot tubs, just to keep stuff from growing. And compared to chlorine, bromine dissolves in water three times better, and its activity in water is short since it doesn't bind to the water strongly. However, it's extremely reactive, and large amounts of bromine are required for adequate disinfection of water. So it's less effective than chlorine overall, it has these stability issues, so for that reason I think we could put bromine into like D tier. I sure love beverages which are sterilized by ethanol. Ethanol is a type of alcohol that's commonly used for disinfecting surfaces. Ethanol has a similar mechanism of action to isopropanol, being able to rapidly kill bacteria in seconds. However, it's possible for certain bacteria, such as gram-positive bacteria, to develop resistance to ethanol. Due to its low molecular weight compared to isopropyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol ends up being a more effective disinfectant against bacteria. Ethanol is more volatile than isopropanol, meaning that it doesn't stay on the surface as long as isopropanol would. Additionally, since isopropanol has that extra alkyl group, it's able to more effectively interact with the cell membrane and disrupt it. However, denatured ethanol is considered to be more effective as a virucidal disinfectant, as isopropanol isn't effective against non-enveloped viruses. So there's some pros and cons compared to isopropanol, so I think for that reason, we can put it into like C tier, but it might belong in B tier, because there are some pros. Actually, I think we can put it into B tier. B for beer. Last but not least, we have this non-chemical. This is a light bulb. When light bulbs emit light and it's really high energy, this is emitted at a high frequency, which is also known as a low wavelength. At wavelengths between 200 to 300 nanometers, UV disinfection is most effective. It works by being absorbed into the DNA of bacteria, destroying its structure and inactivating cells. It's been considered environmentally friendly, and can kill microorganisms in seconds. It's also used because bacteria are unable to become UV resistant. While it's useful to disinfect instruments, it's harmful when exposed to humans for a long time, as long-term exposure to UV can cause cancer. So overall, light's pretty effective, it can give you a nice tan, and it can also give the bacteria a tan that doesn't go away, because they die. If you're using certain UV lamps, they can sometimes produce ozone, which is toxic, as we mentioned earlier. Additionally, certain wavelengths of UV will be more effective for sterilizing against bacteria than others. So if you're using something that's like 400 nanometers, that's not going to be as effective as the lower wavelengths would be. Overall, it's a pretty good disinfectant, but it's not a chemical, so it can go right into F tier. In this video, we discussed a number of disinfectants, their applications, and why they would be chosen. I hope that the discussion of disinfectants has been infectious. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.